normal probability distribution is the most important distribution in all of statistics. It's one that we will use all of the time because of its utility. Now, there are specific times when we use a uniform probability distribution or an exponential distribution or a Poisson distribution, but the normal probability distribution gets used very frequently because the normal probability distribution models pretty much everything. Height, weight, IQ, shoe size, levels of resilience or neuroticism, rainfall, GRE scores, crop yields, blood pressure, this is what makes the normal distribution the most important distribution in statistics. We can use it for so many different things. Well, because this distribution is so important, we need to spend a little time understanding the characteristics of the normal curve. The first characteristic is that the normal curve is a smooth, continuous line. And this is because it is a theoretical distribution. When we get raw data from the real world, they will be roughly normally distributed. The example that we're using here is a perfect normal curve, hence that smooth continuous line. The normal curve is symmetrical. If you were to fold this curve in half on the dotted line, the left half and the right half would line up exactly. The skewness of a normal curve equals zero, and the excessive kurtosis would equal zero. We will use a normal distribution with interval or ratio level continuous data. So this would not be a discrete distribution, a continuous distribution, continuous data for a normal curve. The y-axis will be missing. With discrete probability distributions, we always included that y-axis because we needed to know whether we were going to sell one, two, three, four cars in a given day. With this example, we don't have a y-axis, but it is understood to be there, and the y-axis still stands for the frequency of the score occurring at any particular point. So there's no labeling of the y-axis. Higher just means more. At the top of the curve is the most frequently occurring score. Less frequently occurring scores will be out in the tails of the curve. The scores that are way out in the tails, far from the mean, would be outliers or extreme scores. The mean is also equal to the median, and it's also equal to the most frequently occurring score, which is the mode. So in a normal distribution, mean equals median equals mode. And we can use that later, because if we have a distribution in which we measure the mean, median, and mode, and they are equal we can assume that that's most likely going to be a normally distributed distribution. The mean can be any value. It could be positive, it could be negative, it could be zero. Because remember, so many things can be modeled with this normal curve. It could be anything. We can have normal distributions with any type of mean. The standard deviation for any normal curve determines the width of the curve. In this example, we have a normal distribution has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 25. If the standard deviation is larger, then the curve will become wider. With the standard deviation of 40, we see how the curve has widened. And if the standard deviation is smaller, the standard deviation of 10, for example, then the curve will become more narrow. Because of the that perfect nature of that normal curve, we can determine exactly the probability of where scores occur underneath any portion of the curve. The upper and lower halves of the curve are identical. They contain the same proportion. So exactly half, a proportion of 0 0.5000 of the scores will be above the mean, and the same proportion of 0.5 will be below the mean. And this allows us to use the empirical rule as we look at other scores underneath the curve. 68% of the scores under a normal curve will be within one standard deviation above and below the mean. 95% of scores will be within two standard deviations of the mean. 
and 99% of scores will be within three standard deviations of the mean. This can also be helpful when we are looking for outliers. If we have a score and we calculate a z-score for that value, and it has a, a value of, um, of a 6.8 or a 12.2, that's like 12 standard deviations away from the mean. Highly unlikely. It's not like most of the other scores because 99% of the scores will be within three standard deviations. And we could use that to help identify outliers, anything greater than three standard deviations above or below the mean. This is the formula for the probability density function of a normal curve. Good news, you do not have to memorize this formula. Completely unnecessary. I just wanted to show you the formula and assure you that although I've been teaching stats for a lot of years, I have never actually used this formula in real life. It's more of a thing that stats teachers do to convince you, a student, that we know what the formula looks like. But we're not actually going to use this. I have a much simpler formula that we will use that will be very practical. However, there's a few things that I do want to point out. Number one is the notation that we would use to describe a curve. We would say that x is a random variable with a normal distribution, and it has a mean and a standard deviation. For a standard normal curve, we would say that x is a random variable with a standard normal distribution, and we know that it is a standard normal distribution because the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. But there's one other important part of this, this formula that I want to point out to you, and that is the letter E. A quick digression on this number. This is well, it looks like Leonard Euler, but that is not his name. He's a Swiss mathematician, and so his last name is pronounced Euler. When you see E, that's Euler's number, and it is always 2.71828. In the same way that pi stands in for the number 3.1415, one way to know if you know your stuff in statistics is that you pronounce Euler's number correctly. So now, you will always appear smart to your statistical friends because you know how to pronounce Euler's number. There is a very special occurrence of the normal curve, which is called a standard normal curve. Remember, because the normal curve can be used with so many things, we might say that there is a family of normal curves, all of which have different means and standard deviations. However, if a normal curve has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, it is a standard normal curve, or it has been standardized. We could take any of the family of normal curves, and we could standardize it. We could shift it from its mean and standard deviation to a standard normal curve, which has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Any normally distributed random variable can be converted from its distribution to a standard normal curve. And that letter Z designates a standard normal random variable, and their formula here is z equals the raw score of x minus the population mean of mu divided by sigma, which is the standard deviation. Or z could be understood as how many standard deviations a given score is from the mean. We're going to put this to use as we learn about z-scores. If we wanted to answer a question like, how far from the mean is a score with a z equal to 1.50, we can answer that with the standard normal curve formula. Or what proportion of scores is below a z of 1.00? Or what proportion of the scores are below a negative 1.25? All of those questions can be answered with our standard normal z-score formula. I want to show you how the book recommends that we do this calculus, and then I'm going to show you a much easier way to get there. If we want to know the proportion of scores that fall below a z of 1.50, here's how we would approach that. But first of all, we need to know the, the scores between the mean and our z-score of 1.5. And to answer that question, we would go to the z table. There's one of these in your textbook. There's also one of these in the spreadsheet I'm going to show you. You can Google Z table and you can get a copy of one. Here's how you would use it. 
we're looking for a z of 1.5, and so we would work our way down this first column until we find 1.5. Now we want a 1.50, so we would be able to look at this very first column where we see a z uh, or a, a z score of 0.4332. Now, if uh, that would be a probability of that. If we were looking for a z-score of 0.153, we would move across to the column for 0 0.03. If it was 1.57, we would use the column for 0 0.07. So let's use a slightly different example. This time we're going to look for the proportion of scores below a z of 1.00. Here's how we would start. We were looking for scores below 1.00, and we see that that 1 is above the mean. So we would start by figuring out the proportion of scores between the mean and 1.00, which is a proportion of 0.314. Now, we know the scores from the mean to that z-score, but we also need all the scores below the mean. And do you remember the proportion of scores below the mean? 0.5. We would therefore add our proportion of 0.3413, to the value of 0.5, and we come up with a proportion of 0.8413. That's the proportion below a mean of, or a z of 1.0. If you took a test and you scored at a standard deviation of 1, or a z score of 1.0, you have scored above 84.13% of everyone else who took the test. Or if your height z score is one standard deviation of the, above the mean, you are taller than 84.13% of other people of your uh, age and, and weight range. In this example, we'll use a negative z-score, and we're looking for values below a z of negative 1.25. We'll use the same idea. We're looking for scores below, or probabilities below, a certain value. We'll start by finding the probability of scores between the mean and that z-score. In this case, a z of negative 1.25 has a proportion of 0.3944. That's the, the, the probability between the mean and that value. But we want to know scores below that value, and below that would be the rest of the lower half of the curve. And so we would then subtract our probability from 0.5, leaving us with 0.1056. If you took a test and scored at a negative 1.25 z-score, or negative 1.25 standard deviations, you scored higher than roughly 11% of others who took that same test. Well, it turns out that's a lot of work, and it's a lot of thinking, and there's a lot of steps to keep track of. So I've tried to simplify this by creating a spreadsheet that I call the Normal Distribution Z Multi-Tool Excel Spreadsheet. This is going to use the formulas that have been recommended in the textbook, uh, but they're put into a structure that makes them much easier to use. We'll be using formulas like the norm S distribution, uh, the, the normal sample inverse. The S means it's a standard normal probability distribution. When you open up that, that multi-tool spreadsheet, which you can get from the classroom, or if you're watching this online, you can also get to it through the, the link in the description for the video. Go to the Google Drive and find this and download it. What you can see with this multi-tool is there are multiple tabs at the bottom of the sheet. You begin with the instructions, and each of these, uh, these tabs in blue are actually hyperlinks that will take you to that part of the table. So we have the Z formula, which is where we're going to be able to find, we're going to be able to use the z-score formula. We have the z-calculator, which will help us find probabilities above and below, and areas. That's where we're going to begin with this next example. But I'll also show you what else is in there. We have the z-test. If we're doing a z-test, we have one more bit of information we need to answer. We have the mean, the raw score, the standard deviation, and the sample size. We can enter those, get a z-score, and get the probability for that z-test. The z-table that I mentioned earlier is contained right here in this tab. And finally, it's a list of videos that cover material about what is contained in these tabs. So I'm going to start with the areas tab. And what you will notice is that we have 
we're looking for areas using a positive z-score, above or below a positive z-score. If you scroll down a little bit, we see probabilities above or below a negative z-score. Between or outside of two z-scores, or really the same thing if the z-scores are both negative or both positive. So let me give you a quick example of how we might use these. I'm going to start with the positive z-scores. We're looking for a proportion, let's say, greater than 1.23. We'll just enter 1.23 where it says enter z positive z-score, and you'll see that proportion. It's a 0 0.1093. Uh, for the z-score less than a positive 2.61, we get a proportion. It's a 0.9955. And you can change these z-scores. Enter any other z-score, and you will get the proportion. Scroll down a little bit. We have now the negative z-scores. Let's enter a negative 0 0.0, or a negative 0.86, and we will see that, uh, we'll say, roughly 80% of scores are above that z-score. Or we could enter a negative z-score of negative 1.11 and get the proportion for that. Scroll down a little bit more and we can look at the between or the outside figures. So if we're looking for probabilities between a negative 1.28 and a positive 0.5, we get a proportion for 0.5912. We can enter values of a negative 0.99 and a positive 1.39 and we would get those proportions. This is the proportion outside of those two values. Scroll down a little bit more. If the z-scores are both negative or both positive, if they're on the same side of the line, the line being the mean, we can enter both of the negative z-scores, or we could enter both of the positive z-scores and get the proportions between those two. So I hope you find this spreadsheet much easier to use. You can enter a number, get the proportion, it kind of does the math for you. You can also look at the formulas. All of the formulas are easily available, there's nothing locked down, everything is visible, so you can see how I constructed these formulas and you can use those on your own as well. So let's do an example with this. On a typical cruise, the bar goes through 1,250 pineapples for pina coladas. I also learned a lot about how much food goes on each cruise. There is a lot of food consumed for a typical cruise. I guess when you have 4,000 people on a cruise for a week, they can go through a lot of food. The standard deviation for our number of pineapples is 120. What is the probability that a given cruise would use 1,400 pineapples? Let's see, see what values we know. We have a mean of 1250, with a standard deviation of 120, and a raw score of 1400. So now go to the tab that says the Z formula. And we're gonna use box one for this example. We know the values that we know, and we can see those are the values that are available to enter, in this case to calculate a Z score. In box one, we would enter the x value of 1400, the mean of 1250, and the standard deviation of 120. The box that says click to calculate isn't really a functional box, but you have to click out of the last box where you've entered data. So you literally you could click anywhere else on the spreadsheet. I just gave you a place to click in case uh, you entered numbers and wondered what was going to happen next. If you weren't sure, just click on that box. The math will be done for you. So we see that we have a z-score of 1.25, and that z-score will actually populate over in box 3. You can also enter this score on your own if you'd like. It will mess up the formula that's already entered there. So this 1.25 gets populated over in box 3, and we see our proportions above and below that particular z-score. The proportions above are 0.1056, so roughly 11%. Uh, if you have uh, 1,400 pineapples on board, there's uh, only 11% of the, the cruises that would ever use more than that. Roughly 90% of the cruises are going to use 
that or fewer number of pineapples at the bar. Well, now the price of pineapples has gone up. So Ted is considering ordering fewer pineapples, knowing that some cruises will run out. How many pineapples should he order if he's okay with 20% or fewer cruises running out? Or if he orders 1,200, how many cruises will run out? What proportion of cruises use between 1,200 and 1,400? Or what proportion of cruises use 1,325 or fewer? To answer these questions, we'll also use that Z formula tab in this multi-tool for the normal distribution. We're going to use box six for this example. We need to enter the known values, which would be the mean and the standard deviation. We know that our mean value is 1,250, and our standard deviation is 120. For most examples, you'll just leave the N set to 1. But if there is a problem in which you need to change the sample size, you could change it here, and that will actually calculate the standard error of the mean for the denominator in just a, instead of the standard deviation. How many should he order if he wants 20% or fewer cruises to run out? To answer this first question, let's be sure that we put the mean and standard deviation in a second place, and that is in box 7. So we enter our mean of 1250, our standard deviation of 120, and the question is how many should he order if he wants 20% or fewer cruises to run out? Put that probability of 0.2 in the probability box. And we see that the x value is 1350.99. We'll round that to uh, 1351. If he has 1351 pineapples on board, 20% of cruises might run out, but 80% of cruises will have more than enough pineapples for their cruise. If he orders 1,200, how many cruises will run out? Well, enter 1,200 in this X1 box, and this is in, the, in box number six. So we enter 1,200, and we will get a, popular, or we will get a value, a probability of 0.6615. If we want to know between 1,200 and 1,400, put the 1,400 in X2, and the probability will pop up in this second set of blue boxes. It's a 0.5559, uh, so roughly 55.6% of cruises used between 1,200 and 1,400 pineapples. How about 1,300 or fewer? Well, for that, we will need to change the X value. So I change the X1 box, and my new probability values less than 1325. We have probability of 0 0.7340. So as you work through examples, whether from the textbook or real life, you can use this, this uh, it's like a Swiss army knife for statistics to help answer questions about probability. And that's what we need to know for now about the normal distribution. <laughs>